All right. When you're analyzing a single variable, a single quantitative or numerical variable, there are two things we focus on um, more than anything else. Number one is the center, and number two is the spread or the variability or the variance. Well, variance is a specific kind. So let's talk about um, variability. Let's look at this uh, dot plot histogram -y kind of thing of some values here. I don't know, maybe it's like mm -hmm. number of friends you have this week or something like that. You can calculate the mean here. If you add up those numbers and divide by the number there are, I think you'll find that the mean is 5. So let's put a blue line. It's not an observation. It's The, the mean isn't an observation. It's it's uh, something that, it's a piece of information that you made up, that you extracted. So it's um, a different kind of thing. There's the mean. Now, let's look at the deviation of each dot from that mean. And that's spread. That's you find a middle point, and then you find, on average, how far each of your dots is, each of your observations is, from the middle point. So that's, and we can argue about what kind of average we use in saying how, aver on average, how far. And we can argue about which middle point we use, like a median or a mean, or one of the many flavors of mean and median that are available out there. But that's what you do. You find an average, and then you find how far, on average, each observation, or the observations are from that average. So let's do that. The distance between an observation and the mean is called a deviation. So here's this uh, this person who has one friend. They are negative four deviation from the mean. And the other person who has one friend also negative four. Now we want to manipulate the way we calculate deviations so that negative deviations indicate that you're below the mean and positive is above the mean. That has some good advantages later on. Well, you don't always care, but sometimes. Now, the person who has two friends has a negative three deviation. See? One, two, three. They're three away. And this person who has three friends is a negative two, and four is a negative one. So those are the deviations. And on the positive end, the person who has nine friends is a positive four. The people who have eight friends are a three. And the, person who has, the two people who have seven friends are a positive two each. Those are all the deviations. So one really nice measure of variability is just the median, the median absolute deviation, MAD. That gets used for a lot of stuff. So if you just ignore the sign and just add up the deviations, and you know, the negative four becomes positive four, so four plus four plus three plus two plus one, and then on the positive side. Uh, 4 plus 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 2. You add all those together and divide by the number of observations, you'll get the me the median, well, not divide, you'll add all those together, and then you find the median of deviation. Then you'd find the median deviation. That's the average deviation from this average. But usually you would find the average deviation from the median, not from the mean. Anyway, there's a lot of little tweaky variables you can do. But you could you could just use abs absolute deviations. You could do use the average either the mean or the median absolute deviation. And actually, that would make a lot of sense. So if you just took all these devi deviations and just said, how long are the lines, essentially? That's the, that's the average deviation. However, we want to use this in some funky statistical procedures later, especially inferential stats. And it turns out that mathematically and theoretically, it's really nice to square these things first and then unsquare them. So visually, I don't know if this helps at all. You take all the numbers and you square them. And when you square a line, it turns into a square. A one-dimensional thing squared turns into a two-dimensional thing. So that deviation of 4 becomes 16. Well, a negative 4 becomes 16. I should have made that negative. Um, so if you add all that area together, if you add all these squares together, that's... That's the total squared deviation. So if you add up all the squared deviations, there they are, and you take the mean, so the mean or the average squared deviation, now for reasons I'll explain later, you don't divide by 10. There were 10 observations. Sometimes we would divide by 10 if we were treating this as a population, but if we're treating it as a sample, we have to divide by one less than that. And we can talk about that later. It's because you estimated a mean. It's degrees of freedom. It's a funky thing. Just memorize that it's n minus 1 for samples, n for populations. So the average squared deviation is 9.78.
If you take the square root of that, you have the average squared then unsquared deviation. So squaring and then unsquaring, it has the nice property that it takes all those negative deviations, makes them positive, so you can add them together without them just canceling each other out. And But then when you unsquare it, you're back into regular units. So if it's number of friends, then you can say that the average number of friends is five, but the average amount by which people are different from the average is 3.13 friends. So the standard deviation is the average difference from the mean. It's just arrived at in a really roundabout way. And as I mentioned, there are multiple ways. We could have done average difference by just taking the average absolute difference, which would have been much simpler mathematically. But it doesn't have these beautiful theoretical properties. Um, this issue of summing up squared values, squared deviations, is really important for some later stuff that we're going to do in this class. Analysis of variance and uh, t-test regression those inferential procedures later on. So we prefer the standard deviation for a lot of applications. So the standard deviation is 3.13. And so then we can talk about our distribution according to looking at the where the mean is and then measuring plus or minus a certain number of standard deviations. This is really important in chapter three. So the standard deviation isn't just a measure of variability, and it is. It's a measure of spread. A bigger standard deviation means your data are spread all over the place, really wide. And a small standard deviation means that they're all clustered together. The very smallest standard deviation would be zero, and that's if every data point in your data set is exactly the same value. So if you recruit a whole bunch of people and they're all exactly 23 years old, then there's no variability of age, and the standard deviation of age is zero because there's no deviation. The mean is all the values, right? So there's no deviation. Um, but more than just telling us about the spread, it becomes a ruler that we, we can use to mark out distances within the distribution. We start at the mean and then we mark up or down a certain number of standard deviations. Not always 1, 2, and 3, but like 1.6 standard deviations or negative 2.8 standard deviations. We will want to do that later for some reasons that I don't really want to explain right now. Um, so Variance is what you get before you get the standard deviation. Variance is the average squared deviation. We write this as sum of quantity x minus x bar squared, which means we do what we did. For each observation, you take the observation minus the mean. Don't do mean minus the observation. I mean, it won't turn out differently, but it's good to get in this habit. If you do the observation minus the mean, then uh, observations that are below the mean we'll get a negative value for that, and those above will get a positive value. So that x minus x bar, that's a deviation. That's one deviation of one score from the mean. So for each score, you take the difference between it and the mean, and you square that. And then you add all those deviations up together. So the sigma comes after the parentheses and the exponents are all taken care of. So you do what's in the parentheses first to every number. You square the result of every one of those. And then when you're done and you have a bunch of squared deviations, then you add them all up and you divide by n minus 1. For example, if you were looking at a population, you'd just divide by n. Um, and then if you take the square root of that whole mess, which isn't that big, but it's a bit messy, then you have the standard deviation. So there you go, there's your formula. There are other formulas. You can use algebra to manipulate this so that you can calculate this by hand. I'm not going to have you doing an awful lot of hand calculation, a bit. I'd like you to do everything once or twice or three or four times, but not tons. But there's your formulas. Now, the notation, population parameters, we say the standard deviation is a lowercase sigma, S for standard deviation. And the variance is sigma squared. And actually, that works out because if you take any standard deviation and square it, then you get the variance, right? And if you take any variance and take the square root, you get the standard deviation. So the symbols correspond exactly to mathematically what's going on with them. And then in sample statistics, you just do an S for a standard deviation and S squared for variance. So if you see those symbols running rampant, you're, you're going to know a little bit more about what they, they are. Um, so for an exercise, you can do this. Find the standard deviation of hours spent studying for an exam. So let's say we interview a bunch of students, and we ask them how many hours they spent studying for the last exam they took. And here's all the students, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. How nice. There's 10 of them. And those are their observations. They're all in a nice order. They don't have to be in order for this. They don't have to be in any order. They just all have to be there. And you're seeing right now why it's so handy to list variables as a vertical column. 
Um, there's a whole world of calculation by hand that's grown up around this in the past century. Not that a lot of people do by hand calculations anymore, but it's still useful to remember how to organize data. So you can sum up all the values. You can M, I'm saying M is the mean in this case because X bars are a pain to draw. So we can take X minus X bar. So once we've got everything in a column there, make a column of all the deviations. So if the mean is 5.3, oh, this is my former data. It wasn't number of friends. It was, I was not studying for the exam, silly me. If the mean was um, 5.3, then, then zero is negative 5.3, etc. And then you square them. You square the deviations. You sum all the squared deviations, and that would give you 90.1. So that's the sum of squared deviations, and that's a big deal in ANOVA. And then you take the average of that. So 90.1 divided by 9, which is n minus 1. So you get just about 10 as the variance. And then the standard deviation is the square root of that. 3.16. So that's how you would calculate that. So here's an exercise you can do. Potential voters in two counties indicated their approval rating of Mitt Romney's platform. You can tell when I made this. Um, which county has the most variable Romney approval ratings? Figure this out by calculating S squared. In other words, the sample standard deviation. So let's say Hidalgo County and Star County, Texas. Here's your data. So I'll leave this up here, and you can go through and figure out a standard deviation for Hidalgo and a standard deviation for Star and see which one's bigger. I'll pause for a minute, and then I'll go walk through this. All right, I'm going to walk through this. 10.29 here, 7.14 here. So Hidalgo is more variable. By the way, I made all this variable, all this data up. It's fake. Um, I don't actually have any idea if Hidalgo is more variable or not. So there are two very good, robust measures of variability. There's the interquartile range. There's some code for R, not that you need that. And you can, I think you can get that from SPSS too. I'll have to figure that out. And then there's the median absolute deviation. Those are both, they'll give you kind of different answers. And if you use one, you kind of get used to what its values look like. And if you use the other, you can get used to it. These are very good very robust measures of variability because just like measures of central tendency, standard deviation and variance are based on the mean. Remember, everything is taken as a deviation from the mean. So if you have a few extreme high scores or a few extreme low scores, both the mean and the measures of variability based on it, standard deviation and variance, are going to be affected by those extreme values. So we need robust measures in those circumstances. They don't get used that much. Median absolute deviation and IQR, however, are very good. IQR is just the difference between Q1 and Q3. And median absolute deviation is the median absolute deviation from, I believe it is the mean. But they don't get used all that often. And now I'm done with that.